Okay, I think we are live. Sorry for the delay, but this always happened. Welcome to our new webinar of Low Physics. Uh, We're very happy and we would like you to join to our next seminars. Webinars, please stay tuned over YouTube, our YouTube channel, Twitter, Facebook to see our schedule, which is very nice. Today, we are very happy to have Marcelo Ponce, who is joining us from University of Toronto. A little bit about him. He got his PhD uh, from RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, I believe so it was in 2011. Before that, he got his master's in theoretical physics from Universidad de la República in Uruguay. Uh, that was in 2008. He did a bachelor in physics in 2003 from the same university. And surprisingly enough, he also engineering and maybe he will talk about why he started like that and also like in 1996 uh, he was a programmer analyst he is a world expert on many topics re regarding high performance computing and also numerical relativity and astrophysics that's how I met him uh, and right now um, he is a um, computer neural scientist and HPC scientific analyst at the University of Toronto um, before, after he finished his PhD, he, he went to Perimeter Institute and University of Guelph for some postdoc experience. And today he's going to talk about HPC in physical sciences. So Marcelo, thank you very much. Remember, uh, we, I, I would like to remember everybody that they can uh, write, type all the questions over the YouTube channel or over Twitter, and then we will uh, read to Marcelo to them. So Marcelo, thanks for joining us. Hi, Alejandro. Uh, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very nice for, for the kind introductions and for the invitation for, uh, to, to uh, have this webinar. Uh, as Alejandro was saying, my, uh, my experience has gone through a lot of different uh, aspects in physics, but one thing that I, most of, of the different topics I have been working uh, in is uh, computational physics and some degree of computation. So, what I'm planning for today, for the webinar today, is to try to show you a little bit of what is the, the common denominator in, in my career path. Um, so probably should start um, sharing my screen of work. So I hope that you are seeing my presentation by now. So the, the title for today is The Role of Scientific Computing in Physics, and I, I add a little bit of other sciences because scientific computed HPC, as we will see, is a, a bit of everything and almost everywhere. So let's see. So I, I had to warn you, I had a lot of slides, as, as you can see. I, I don't think we will have time to cover everything. But uh, the truth is that this presentation probably should be like three or four presentations at once. So we will see what, how far we can go. and. At some point, we can actually uh, ask if there is any particular interest in, in a specific topic that you would like me to cover, because I'm going to be talking about high performance computing. I'm going to be talking about the, the trends in AI in artificial intelligence. And I'm going to argue uh, that uh, you know making a, a clear distinction between these two uh, different fields or fields that appear to be different at the beginning is, is hard to say or hard to draw in some cases. Uh, but, but let's start and let's see how it goes. Um, so a little bit of, of, about myself, as, as you probably heard, my name is Marcelo Ponce. I am working as a computational research scientist at Cynet. It's a, it's a full mouth name for just saying a researcher doing basically the kind of things that you like to do. What is Cynet? Well, Cynet is the supercomputer center at the University of Toronto. So not only we can do research, but we can use the most powerful supercomputer available to researchers in Canada. So we are very proud to have the two, oops, sorry, the two largest supercomputers in Canada. Actually, the, the newest one, uh, it has been deployed this uh, past year at the beginning of uh, 2018. It's less than a year old. Um, it's a very powerful supercomputer. I, I will tell you a little bit more about it uh, later on. Um, but just to give you an idea, our, our machines has of the order of 30 to 60,000 cores. 
and they are ranked in position 60 right now, the latest one in the top 500 uh, chart, which is a, it's a chart that basically organized from the largest supercomputers, the fastest supercomputers in the world. Uh, a little bit of my my research uh, background and experience. I, I my my background is in theoretical physics and computational astrophysics, if you wish. Most of my work uh, is on the field of numerical relativity, simulating the merger of black holes, multiple black holes, binary black holes, uh, binary neutron stars, uh, accretion disks. And I had the pleasure to, to work with uh, Alejandro Supervisors, Nico Yunes, um, another good friend of mine, Enrico Barause, in, uh, in a bit of discretion of the path of Shi'ar uh, in alternative theories of gravity, scalar, scalar field theories of gravity. But again, all that work has been done through uh, numerics, through computations. In addition to that, as Alejandro was mentioning, my, my um, master thesis was done in quantum gravity. Uh, we did for the first time, we, we implemented for the first time what is called a consistent discretization approach, which was applied to a cosmological model. Um, in that case, it was a, a, chi, a quite a hard implementation because the, the questions were complicated, but actually the, the algorithm itself is complicated. So if you go and look at the paper, it's, it's kind of involved. Uh, but it's very interesting problem because it tackles not only, it's a, it's a problem that not only tackles the numerical issues, but also tackles the conceptual issues when you try to marry uh, quantum mechanics and, um, and general relativity, in other words, quantum gravity. In addition to that, because I was young and I'm full of energy at that time, I was doing also some complex networks studies. Um, basically, we're studying the synchronization of, of properties in a, in a network uh, that is modeled by, by basically topology and the interactions in the nodes. And again, all this work was done mostly simulating these interactions in computers and then trying to make sense of them. And finally, and lastly, in the last couple of years, because at, at the same time that I'm doing uh, research here at the Supercomputer Center, I also teach a lot of the courses for the university. So I was exposed and in touch with the students from other fields. So that's one of the nice things. And I, I, I think I always kind of like to do is to have this kind of multidisciplinary approach and, and collaborations with other fields. So we started working in bioinformatics pipeline. So we have been developing a bioinformatics pipeline to analyze uh, data coming from chromatin immune precipitation sequencing of DNA. So that's a little bit of, of my background. Uh, so let me show you a bit of the motivation and, and why one would be interested in considering research computing if you haven't done so, because nowadays it's, it's, it's almost everywhere. So just, just to back up a little bit and, and come back to what, what research computing or also known as computational science or scientific computing is. So basically it's using a device like a computer to figure out numerical values or quantities uh, for the pursuit of a particular interest, right? And this is very generic and you can think, okay, this may apply to almost anything. And that's the, that's the thing. The one thing I want to, to differentiate here is the terms. It, it can be a bit, um, not confusing, but you know, people can very easily uh, get around computational science with computer science. And that is a big difference that we have with our friends from the computer science department, where those guys, they do very important work and, and, and shop implementing things, but it's more from the theoretical side. It's more like a computer engineer than, than, than a scientist itself. So one of the things that we usually like to think or analyze is, okay, how and why people use computers? Uh, or computers. So there are different cases and it's hard to, again, differentiate between all of them because there are so many. But if you if you have a broad spectrum, you can say, okay, well, people may do uh, or use computers to, do, to deal with large data uh, processing cases or data mining, uh, investigate the behavior of models that are too complex to deal with, with uh, pencil and paper. Uh, trying to understand experimental results using a theoretical model, finding simple models from more complex ones. Visualization is a big area of, of research and also when one wants to show uh, results as I'm going to, to do in, in, in a few seconds, uh, visualization is, is another big thing. Of course, there are more. The other interesting thing that uh, is shifting the, the paradigm in the way that we pursue science, at least from the computational side, 
is that research computing is start to be uh, what is called the third leg of science. And I like to put this dichotomy between experiment and theory, and in particular in physics, this is very well known, right? Usually people in, in the theoretical side don't talk too much to the experimental side, unless that you are forced to do so because you are in a big experiment like LAC or a collaboration, right? Like LIGO, for instance, or something like that. But this dichotomy, this kind of separation, what we have observed is that this basically being merged or fashed uh, by the computation. So we like to think that research computer and scientific computing as the third leg of science of this third category, where basically not only can be used by experiment and theory at the same time, but also can, can, shed, uh, can shed light in both uh, and can offer more resources for the, for the researchers. If you think about a, a simulation, for instance, uh, a, a, an analysis of simulations, it looks more, to, uh, it looks more similar to what we will say is a well-controlled experiment. Um, but the one thing I will argue, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, is that you need to have some skills uh, unique to this particular new field, new area, in order to harvest uh, the best of it. Uh, so one of the skills, obviously, is programming, because that's the way that uh, in which we communicate with computers. Uh, so you usually need to do a bit of programming to basically write, uh, write your simulations. Uh, depending on, on the problem that you are tackling, you may have to do a lot of programming. Um, related, very close related to that is the selection of the language that you use. It's like how I teach or I tell my computer to do what I have to do or what I want to do. So there are, just to, to set the, the, the ground here, there are two types of approaches here. And, and you will start to see my, my presentation now we will start to merge things from the physics and my, my own research and concepts that we usually uh, had to deal with and had to know for, for implementing this in the HPC side, in the high performance computing side. So the first thing that we would like to differentiate is the type of computer language that we use. We have the compilers and the interpreters. So people writing codes for very demanding simulations to run very fast and take full advantage of computers like uh, like clusters and supercomputers, they may end up using C, C++, and Fortran. These are low-level languages uh, that allow you to take the full advantage of the computer and gain the most of your performance. Now, we have, on, on, on the other hand, interpreter languages that basically what they do is go line by line or, or they are waiting for you to input commands in the, in the shell and the prompt. And basically, as soon as you hit enter, it basically interprets, reads your command and executes it. Examples of this are Python, R, um, and others. So the disadvantage between one and the other is the interpreter is usually a higher language, so you don't need to reconstruct everything from scratch. It's easier to, to uh, get used to deal with them, but you don't get as much performance as with the compiler, compiler languages. On top of that, on top of the programming, which is the instructions that you give to the computer, we also need to design the algorithms. In other words, the techniques, the strategies and methods uh, that we want to use for implementing or, or solving the problem we want to tackle. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about them too. So let me start, and this by no means is a complete review because, the, the, as I say, the techniques and, and algorithms in particular that I use nowadays are humongous in the sense that there are too many. And we are we cannot even be close to scratch the surface of all of them. But let me just review a few of the of the ones that are most used in, in the fields of computational astrophysics at least. So the first thing that comes to mind is to differentiate them between having a mesh free and a mesh algorithm. So what is the difference? Well in the first case when you have a mesh method basically you need a grid. You need a system of coordinates uh, that lay down on your computational domain. And then you divide, you discretize this domain, and then you get coordinates, you get physical quantities like volumes, densities, temperature, pressures, whatever it is that you're interested in, in those particular points. Now, the mesh-free method, again, you still need points to do the computations. They are going to be scattered in the computational domain, but there is no geometrical relationship between them. 
And it may sound crazy at the beginning because the question is how I keep track of those. So I'm going to show you an example of a very powerful technique, a very beautiful, elegant, and simple mathematical technique of how can you do that. So just to give you an idea of which are grid-based methods, mesh grid-free uh, methods, and uh, are like, well, finite difference that you probably are, are all familiar with them, finite element, finite volumes, adapted mesh refinements, and others are examples of, of grid-based methods. If you think a particular example can be a spectral methods of this, uh, mesh or grid-free methods are basically particle-based methods and body simulations, a smooth particle hydrodynamics, SPH for short, are cases of those. I'm going to be talking about SPH in a second. And of, of course, you can have combination of these ones, and I will show you an example of, of a result that we obtain by combining these two. So let me very briefly review and, and um, remind us all about the n-body particle method. You basically are solving uh, the classical gravitational problem, n-body problem, uh, just a second derivative of, of uh, positions with respect to time, equal to the sum of the masses and the difference in the distances of the positions divided by the, the distance squared. Uh, now, we will have n particles. So we will have to repeat this summation for each of the particles. And of course, we will have initial conditions for them. So how is the algorithm, a straightforward algorithm to solving the n-body problem? Well, you calculate the net force on a given particle on a given time. You determine the new position of the particle at uh, somewhat advanced time. And, and there you go. So now, um, just, just a historical um, uh, note here, if you wish. The first embody simulation was done in 1941. This is way before having computers accessible in the, in, the, in the traditional way we have it. It was done by Eric Holmberg in the Land Observatory in Sweden. And this is, I, I found it super cool because you can see here how, how people figure out things to do in, in a different manner at different times in history, right? So what this guy, what this guy did was, okay, I have light bulbs. Uh, you know, the electric field of, of, of the light emitted by the bulb uh, goes like one over R squared. So basically it has the same behavior as the gravitational field, one over R squared. So what you can do is you can put light bulbs in a table, right? Representing the position of the particles. Then the luminosity of these light bulbs will represent how the gravitational field uh, decays in distance. And then you can put photosensors. So basically, they were measuring the luminosity of these light bulbs, then writing that into paper, doing the computation, and then moving the light bulbs according to the new force that they compute. So I, I think it's a remarkable example, a very early remarkable example of uh, you know the beginning of what is an algorithm, a method implemented with the tools uh, that you had at that time. Uh, again, I, I, I know it's, it's nowadays is. Uh, you know, okay, you can do that in your cell phone probably. There are embody simulators that runs in your cell phones, but I found it like really inspiring from the from the you know the the way of thinking on the way of figuring out how to do things uh, at at very early times. So that was a, a quick review of embody. Let me show you a technique that I particularly fall in love when I was doing my PhD. It's called a smooth particle hydrodynamics. The main idea is that re you replace the continuum by discrete moving elements, points, or particles, however you want to call it. It's very well uh, known and used in computational fluids. Uh, so the idea is that you can use this for simulating fluids. It has been used in many different fields, astrophysics, ballistics, vulcanology, oceanology, engineering, uh, you name it. It's basically everywhere. The features is a mesh-free Lagrangian method. So if you remember when you have fluids, you can have two ways of describing the motion of fluids, Eulerian uh, description and a Lagrangian description. Uh, one is basically saying, okay, I'm in the lab frame. The other is in, in a commoving frame with the, with the fluid. So that's the main difference. Uh, in this case, the Lagrangian method is basically a commoving frame with the fluids. One of the most beautiful uh, features of this technique is that the resolution so meaning how fine control of the results I'm getting uh, of this method can be easily adjusted with respect to the variables such as the density. 
So there's a lot of math behind this, this method uh, that is very nice and very easy to follow. So if you have students that are starting on this and they want to very quickly get results and overall understand very straightforward the procedure, I will very much recommend to, to take a look at SPH. The other thing is that there are different frameworks, there are different libraries. You can even run SPH course nowadays uh, in Python if you wish. So it's the, the, the learning curve is not steep at all. It's, it's quite swallow, I will say. Um, so this is, this is in a nutshell how SPH works. It divides the fluid into a set of discrete elements. Usually we call these particles. Uh, these particles are finite in size, so they have a spatial distance that uh, basically uh, describe them. It's called the smoothing lens. And all the properties are smoothed by, the, by a kernel function. So that's where the math starts to play. If you think about this, it's kind of, um, you know, atomized or, or, or separate the uh, view of the fluid. So I don't, I don't want to show you too much the math, but I want to show you some of the results that we obtain by using this method. So what you're seeing this, uh, in this slide, and I hope that the movie is played nicely in the, in the transmission, is in the top row, uh, what we study is the effect of a gravitational recoil in a black hole surrounded by an accretion disk. So one thing that people have shown in simulations in numerical relativity is when you have two black holes that they merge, they emit, of course, gravitational waves, which we have been uh, listening and observing since a couple of years now. But also what it may happen is depending on the spin and depending on other configurations on the black hole, the remanent black hole may have a kicked velocity, a remanent velocity uh, that can go up to thousands of kilometers per second. So the question that we had in mind when we started this project is, okay, how can uh, we understand, how can we see uh, the effect of a recoiled black hole that is surrounded by an accretion disk? So what we did was, okay, let's simulate that, let's assume actually that there was a merger of black holes that the remanent black hole uh, has a, a, a gravitational recall is kicked in, in in layman terms and what it will be the effect that you see when uh, there is a, a, a thin disk surrounding this remanent black hole so on the left side the two left panels here they represent the effect on the accretion disk when the kick angle is 15 degrees with respect to the vertical axis of the act of the disk and on the right you see the face on and edge on uh, views of the disk when the kick is 60 degrees so i'm going to play the the movies for you uh one of the nice things is you can create very nice visualizations so you can see in these cases well material is accreted the black hole remains in the center let's play it again because it's a short movie but there is a kind of a shock way escaping the material is kind of depleted in the external parts more accretion is on the center. If you see the edge on view, there's these beautiful patterns like material also being uh, uh, explode out or taken away. For the 60 degrees angle, you will see the pattern is a quite a bit different. What we have done in this, in this paper as well is uh, we estimated the luminosity. So in principle, if a case like this may happen, you should be able to distinguish if you have the, the optical capabilities of, of seeing infrared, um, of detecting and differentiate uh, the angles of the recoil of the black hole with respect to the disk. Now, the figure I had in the bottom, I, I, I like this project very much because in this project we have, we are a bunch of people in this paper. And what we did was to combine several techniques. So we started simulating uh, how a, a neutron star is being disrupted by a black hole. Uh, so there is a neutron star orbiting a black hole. What happened is that then the neutron star is disrupted very dramatically by the black hole. And what we did was that first stage was modeled using a spectral code called SPEC, a spectral Einstein code. Then we imported uh, the material, the density, the, the, the basically how the star was distracted by the black hole, the positions, density, and um, composition of the star into a grid. And then we put that information into our SPH code. So this is a large, um, tiny evolution of that. What you see is one of the final stages, and you can see in the center this kind of cloudy shaped 
uh, isocontours representing what is, whatever is left of the bound material of the star in the center is the black hole. So the, the different colors here represents the density of the star. And then the arrows, this is one of the nice things of this visualization, the arrows represents the velocity of the debris that is uh, basically escaping away from, from the black hole. One thing that we, we were able to prove here is that uh, the, the velocity field is homogeneous as, as uh, you basically go away from the black hole. And this has been theorized for a while, but this is one of the first times that we can actually visualize this. There was a third technique that we added to this simulation that was um, nuclear reaction. Uh, scheme basically. So it's a code that basically can take the temperatures, composition, and density of, of the of the fluids, and then basically uh, see what kind of uh, chemical elements are produced. Uh, so in that case, this simulation was also used to to say how much uh, different type of abundances in the in the composition of the star was was created. Um, I told you at the beginning one of uh, my my PhD thesis was doing computational astrophysics. So I want to show you a couple more of examples. Uh, the one on the left is how we simulate the merger of actually, I think it's a black holes. What we were trying to study at this point was if there was a possibility, a configuration where we can generate a sort of um, toroidal uh, singularity. So, we didn't find any evidence of that, but it was a fun project to, to implement. And then on the right, you will see kind of the same study I was showing you before with the Kicket Black Holes and the SPH. But then at some point it will show, it will switch. Let me actually uh, go there. So this is our simulations of binary neutron stars, where in addition to have the fluid, we have electromagnetic fields. And one of the interesting things when you do this kind of study is that you can actually look at the gravitational way imprinting and pattern, but also tangle or or, or uh, link it to the electromagnetic signatures. And that's something that LIGO in collaboration with other uh, observatories, astronomical observatories has been done in the last year. So we, we were able to simulate the things and provide interesting information to be able to determine which is or what are the um, alignment of the dipoles uh, inside the neutron stars. So all this for say that, for instance, if you are in the field of numerical relativity, you will have to deal with things like the ones I was talking before. Of course, you will be probably developing your own codes. You will be dealing with a lot of mass just to figure out in which way um, is better to actually describe the problem. This may sound as, 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 as trivial, or simple, but let me tell you in particular for numerical relativity, the field was stuck for more than 10, maybe 15 years because the description that people was using to solve the equation was not the appropriate. It was mathematically uh, ill-posed, if you wish. So that is a very important point. So sometimes you need to stop your horses and say, okay, I, I, I'm writing uh, my problem in the computer in the in the right way for being solved. And there are a lot of uh, details, like tiny nasty details that also happen when you when you basically put your problem inside a computer. In addition to that, if you are doing neutron stars or any kind of, of uh, matter, things get complicated because you need to add fluids. And if you want to deal with electromagnetic, you need to add some sort of prescription of how to deal with uh, the electromagnetic side. The good news is if you want to do uh, numerical relativity nowadays, there are several frameworks that are more or less ready for using right away. Actually, they are ready. It's just, uh, you know, if you want to do bleeding edge research, you will need to do some, some tweaking and implementation of your own. But all the infrastructure, you don't need to rewrite Einstein equations, the 40 Einstein equations with all the variables and, and connections and transformations. There is There are frameworks that are already available for you. I, I listed here some of them, and there are hyperlinks to them. So if you're interested, you can just look at them. Uh, the Einstein toolkit, previously known as Cactus, is one of them. Um, the spectral code I was talking about before is all, uh, also another one. And then there is some, uh, uh, another project called WISC, it's an European one that basically allows you to deal with, with fluids and magnetic fields in, in, in general relativity. Uh, so let me 
let me move forward here. So I, I think I'm going to switch gears a little bit now. Well, not switch gears completely, but but take a different approach and I start to to uh, talk a little bit about high performance computing. Um, why we, we need high performance computing, why we need parallel programming in particular, the limits of parallel programming, this is very important. The computer architectures where you run the things, because one thing I want to, uh, one message I want to transmit you today is when you when you do this kind of of, uh, of uh, research, you need to be aware of the machine that you are using, and you need to be aware of the limitation of these machines and which approaches you you may want to take. So let's talk a little bit about HPC. So why is necessary? Well, there are different. Uh, arguments if you wish, if you had or you are dealing with the big data experiments like, uh, you know, LHC in the CERN, um, a few weeks ago, or weeks, uh, sorry, days ago, there was a, a, a breakthrough in one of the Canadian experiments, CHIME, looking at the cosmic microwave background. These guys actually, they host a lot of data in, in, in our site. Uh, they had a very interesting approach of how they, they handle the, the acquisition of, of radio bursts in, um, in the sky. Uh, they use something called FPGAs. I won't be talking about uh, them today, but, but it's, a, it's a very cool thing. It's a very cool device. It's basically a, a computer that can program itself depending on what you want to do. Um, so things like big experiments where you need to basically digest and process a lot of data, that's one of the niche for HPC. Big science, obviously, we all want to do more every time. We don't only want to simulate black holes. We want to simulate black holes in the presence of an accretion disk and in the presence of, uh, you know, binary neutron stars, uh, the formation of galaxies, the core collapse of supernovas. You name it. You always want to, you know, be doing cutting edge research, and that implies, in many cases, you need to push push your boundaries uh, in in order of what kind of computations you can do. New science is another case, um, things that couldn't be done before, the kind of simulations I was doing in my PhD for sure couldn't be done 10 years ago, even five years ago. Uh, as, as we change the computers, many of these things are, are reachable nowadays. The thing to take into consideration though, because this is all nice and good, but there is always a but, um, one thing that we have been noticing, in particular, if you are a kind of a, a, a geeky and you follow uh, computers a little bit, you will notice that the clock speed in the processors, um, they haven't, I, I mean, they have advanced, but they haven't changed much. So bigger and faster memories and this have been lagging as compared to 10 years ago. Uh, the, the point here is, there was a time where you could just wait one more year in the, I'm talking about probably yeah, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you just wait one year, there was a new computer faster, twice the speed. That is not the case anymore. And, I, and you will see how, how we can actually um, hack into this. So in particular, more computer resources here mean more cores running concurrently. And we're going to talk about concurrently. If you think about your laptops, at least your laptops may have probably two or more CPUs. Even your cell phone usually has seven or eight CPUs. Uh, so that's why we need parallel computing. And you will see parallel computing is, is not free. It doesn't come automatic with everything. You need to find your way around it. So uh, why, why actually spending time doing parallel computing? Well, you will get results faster. Uh, there is a limit on how fast a computer can process things. If you have two computers, you can, in, in your best case, you can process at twice the speed. That is not always the case. I will show you mathematically how you can prove that is not the case. But you can, you can tackle bigger problems because now you will have twice the capacity. You will have twice the memory, twice the disk, whatever. You can do more. We want to do the same thing that was done on one computer, but on thousands of computers. Remember, I told you our supercomputer here has 60,000 cores. Uh, so imagine these 60,000 cores doing a computation for you. So if you ask them, okay, solve this equation, but you don't tell how to do it, there will be both, all of them solving the same equation at the same time. So one thing that we will have to change, that we need to change, and we change for taking full advantage of these supercomputers is the algorithms. So one of the, of the messages we always like to, to be clear about is the algorithm, the program, 
that works well in your laptop, in your one core machine, is not the best and most optimal algorithm program running in our supercomputer. And there is a message associated to that, but I will leave that by the end. If you are also a geeky, you may have heard about the Moore's law. So what is Moore's law? Well, Moore's law is a quantitative tendency that engineer Moore uh, noticed in Bell Labs in the 70s, that is, every one year, the number of transistors in, in an integrated circuit uh, duplicated. And, and this is a plot where it shows exactly that. It shows the number of transistors. Uh, we started with thousands in the early 70s. We are in the order of 10,000 millions by 2015. So the plot is, is, uh, is not up to date, but you can see the trend very clearly. It's a log scale, by the way. So this, this trend holds. So wait a second. I told you just seconds ago that our computers are not getting faster. If you buy uh, a laptop, two years ago and you buy a laptop today, you will see that the CPU clock is roughly in two point something gigahertz. It hasn't been going faster than that. So what's the problem? What is the, the so our number of transistors are, are increasing according to Moore law, uh, but our computers are getting faster. So what is the problem? So Moore's law basically describes this trend in history in computing hardware. That's all good. But what Moore's law don't promise or didn't promise is increasing the clock speed. Uh, we have gotten more transistors, but it's getting hard to push uh, the clock speed up. Why? It's basically thermodynamics. The power uh, density that you are basically including in this uh, integrated circuit, is, it basically cannot be dissipated. And I, I would love to invite you to our supercomputer center and you will see the, the most impressive thing there, of course, is the supercomputer, but the second most impressive, it depends who you ask, maybe it's the first or the second, is uh, all the chilling infrastructure, the cooling infrastructure that we had to have for cooling down that piece. We have air flowing, we have uh, uh, water circulating in the uh, rear doors of the of the racks, and we have humongous pipes uh, having water circulating all over the place just to cool down the system. So that's the main reason why people can, or or, or designers, engineers cannot increase the speed of of computers is they they get too hot, they melt down. Um, so what is the the solution to that? Well, instead of increasing the speed we put more cores in parallel doing the job. This is called in, in engineer and layman terms, if you wish, it's called the buy and conquer approach. Um, so this is another way to represent Moore's law, the trends in the, in, uh, in the transistors, in the different cores, but also how you can see the stagnation in the power and in the speed in the different plots. So, let me come back to this idea of concurrency. So concurrency is nothing else than having all these cores doing something at the same time. So it's like having a, a, you know, a factory and now you have several workers, but you want the workers to communicate between them so they can ensemble the product or whatever more efficiently, take less time and do it nicely. So we need to find the parts of your program that can be done independently, separate them and give them to our workers the different cores. Um, ideally, the order of execution in this course won't matter, but when you have data dependencies, and it's in most of the cases, real cases, things start to, to get complicated. So let me show you just a, a simple view of this. So let's say that we had, so each of the mu here represents a core, if you wish. So one to four, uh, let's suppose that we have some data to process. So each of the core process this data and at the end you get an answer. So if this is the case where you can basically split the data in your four processors and it can be done independently, so there is no communication whatsoever here, then this is what we usually call embarrassingly parallel problem, because you basically give a chunk of your data to each core, and then you wait until they're done and you're done. And that's it's easy. You basically scale your problem by the number of cores. This is what is called linear scaling is awesome, okay? Now, how you measure how can we improve over time by running this way? Well, we have a, a concept, a, a definition called throughput, represented by letter H. So that is the number of cores divided by the total time um, that the, the shop takes. So if you are doing this sequentially, as uh, you will do with one core in one computer, you have four of these orange units, the circles representing the, the, the work done by one of these cores, 
is also called task. And then you are set at the end. So the time here is the number of uh, tasks n times t1 is the individual time for each of the tasks. And now your throughput is h, uh, sorry, is one over t1. Now, if you divide this, uh, you do it in parallel. Now your total time is n times t1 divided by p because you have p of this uh, of this uh, course doing at the same time and now your throughput is multiplied by a factor of p so p is the number of processors or cores which basically is increasing h by a factor equal to the number of cores so that's that's one way to to measure how how fast we can do things if we do it in parallel now let, let's talk about scaling so given a problem uh, the question is how can um, how can I measure how fast I can do it with p processors? So that is usually called uh, strong scaling. So in our previous case, the scaling was linear, as I was telling you, and you can see in this plot. So the task per unit time uh, is proportional to p. As I increase p uh, h, the throughput increases linearly. And again, this is the case for embarrassing parallel cases. What happened in reality, oh, sorry, before that. So the, another way to measure this is what we call a speed up. It's another way to measure that is, is instead of just having the throughput is dividing uh, the time of running this problem or this program serially, like which has one core over divided over running it, sorry, with P processes. And again, for embarrassing parallel applications, the scaling is proportional to, to the number of processors, so less a linear speed up. Okay, but remember, this is the ideal case. This is the case where there is no communication. I can't have the 60,000 cores in my supercomputer running independently of each other. They don't need to know anything about the other uh, computation is done in the, in the core next to it. Reality is more complicated like that. So in most of our cases, this is how your program will look like. At the very beginning, you will have what is partitioning of the data. So you take your original data, you divide across your processors, and then each of the processors here is R1 to R4. We'll do the computation. At the end, uh, there is a, what is called a reduction. It's the combination of the results, and your final answer is there. Okay. So this is how, in reality, these things looks like. Uh, so you had a parallel overhead is called at the beginning for splitting the data across the processors. You had a parallel region where you can, if you are lucky enough, and there is, again, no communication between these processors, uh, is embarrassingly parallel. And then you had a serial portion at the end where you recombine the data. Okay. So let's rework our, our scaling equation, the time of the serial uh, divided the time of, of running in parallel. And in this case, I, I, I won't go through the math, it's very simple, but in this case, you can show that this equation can be rewritten in terms of what is the serial fraction number, uh, what is the, the, the serial time divided over the total time of the process. And the most interesting thing that you can show is if you rewrite this equation slightly in this way, uh, and you take p, the number of processors, to uh, infinite, you get something that is no zero, which means that your scaling is never going to be perfect. So even if you have a case which is pretty much ideal, there is, remember, there is no communication here. It's not the case in real world. If you have AMR, there is communication all the time through the boundaries of the domain. But even in this simple case, you can show that your speed that is limited no matter, the, no matter what the size of, of the processors, no matter what number of processors you are using. Okay? So that's one of the, of the uh, take home messages of, of parallel programming, if you wish. So let me very quickly talk a little bit about hardware. Um, because I told you, if you want to take a full advantage of supercomputers, you need to get be familiar with the hardware because the way in which computers organize the memory and process things is, is a bit different. So the type of hardware that you will find in, um, in supercomputer centers usually is categorized in these ones. So clusters or distributed memory machines are the most common ones. It's basically take a bunch of computers, uh, connect them through a network, a very high speed network, ECC, relatively easy and relatively cheap. Then you have multi-core machines. These are machines that share memory among different processors, so they can be seen the same uh, pool of memory. The, the issue with these ones is limited number of cores, and they are much expensive than, than the previous ones. The other ones that are uh, very much in use lately are accelerators machines, either using uh, GPUs, graphic processing units, or, or accelerators like the C on 5. They are quite fast, but they are quite complicated to program. 
And finally, vector machines are the very early supercomputers. Nowadays, all the processors do vectorization, which is try to do several operations at the same time. Uh, but at the very beginning, they were kind of the uh, you know bleeding edge. Most of the supercomputers actually had a hybrid, a combination of these two. And this is the most case a cluster of multi-core machines. So let me very quickly, so I told you clusters are just grab a bunch of, super, of computers, normal computers, connect them with a network. Usually it's a specialized network and, and, and you are in business. Uh, in this case, what happens is each processor communicates to other. Uh, but each processor has its own memory, so that's the red block here. So if you need to transmit or communicate information, you need to do it by, you, by yourself, basically. And the program or the algorithm, the implementation that we use for that is message patch interface, MPI for short. Um, so that's, that's how you, you basically handle that. The shared memory approach is different. So you, the red uh, square now is bigger. All the cores have access to the same uh, red square basically the same memory. So there is no need for communications because communications actually happen through the memory. There are other issues, there are other kind of problems that you can have, but the, the implementation is easier. One of the languages of the implementations that you use for programming these machines is OpenMP. Uh, finally, hybrid architectures is a combination of these. So each block here now is one of the shared memory machines. So there is the big memory pool here, the nodes, and then connected between all the machines. So at the end, you end up using OpenMP plus MPI for, for programming these this computers. On top of that, you, have, you can have a hybrid where each of the units is, okay, the cores plus an accelerator, which could be a CPU or an, or an actual accelerator, okay? If this is the case uh, of your supercomputer, then you may not only use MPI and OpenMP, you may need to use CUDA or OpenCL, which are uh, different languages targeting these accelerators in particular. So programming approaches, uh, let me see if I can go through. It's, it's basically what I mentioned is you have an embarrassing parallel application. You can just basically live with the code that you have. If you have a shared memory machine, OpenMP is your target. Distributed memory is MPI and graphic computing, CPUs, CUDA, OpenACC, or OpenCL. And of course, combination of thereof. Uh, so let me let me backtrack a little bit and do the connection with, with research and science of, of from the hardware side. So we notice at least in our, in our system that people run for different reasons. Astrophysics, as, as the examples I have been showing you, atmospheric physics, I'm going to, to tell you a little bit more about that. High energy, phys high energy particle physics, and I think that we have one of our moderators from that field. Um, you know, if you need to process or deal with the data coming from the LHC, and by the way, we, we, we host some of the data here. I think we are tier three or tier two of uh, LHC uh, data centers, uh, lattice QCD investigations, all these kind of things fall under that category. Contents matter, quantum chemistry, and material science, they basically uh, try to solve um, 15 mil fields approximations using using um, codes. Uh, soft content smarter and medical, uh, chemical, sorry, biophysics. They use a lot of molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo simulations. Engineering, they deal with a lot of optimization problems. And finally, bioinformatics, they has a bus of quantities of genomic data uh, that needs to be processed and it has their own, their own problems by themselves. But this is more or less the niche where we can see the, the uh, role of HPC in current research. Let me tell you about two study cases or two early science cases that were running in our supercomputer, Niagara, uh, that was deployed, as I told you, I, almost a year ago, just a, a bit of the, of the specs that our supercomputer has. Um, these are kind of unique to, to the supercomputer that were designed in this way. I told you, basically, we have a cluster where the computers are connected uh, through a network. Well, we have a very, very uh, high-end network. It's called Dragonfly Plus, which has adaptive routing. So basically, it means that there is a computer controlling the connection between the cores. And what it tries to do is it tries to figure out which is the best path, the path less busy for sending messages between the cores. So it has some smartness on top of the topology of the, of the connection of the networks. The total machine has a power of 4.6 petaflops, means peta floating points operations per second. 
uh, these are 60,000 cores in 1500 nodes, basically it's 40 cores per node and it has hyper threading enabled so you can even reach 80 cores per node. It has a parallel file system, so the nodes don't, don't have a disk, but they have a big uh, hard drive that is uh, shared across all the nodes. On top of that, we have something called burst buffer, which I think has a I don't remember exactly the capacity, but this is a collection. It's an array of solid state devices. Uh, it's hard drives that are faster than the usual hard drives. So it can be used as a temporary storage or if you need to write a lot of things. So we had two, uh, two uh, uh, examples of the early science program that we ran last year. And we had other attempts from which I was part of one, but it wasn't success. Uh, so you know, that happens on science. But let me tell you about the success stories. So we we were awarded um, the best use of HPC in physical science award by HPC Wire and supercomputing last year, which is the most important conference in, in, in supercomputers. And that was for uh, implementing a spatial resolution model of the Pacific Ocean, uh, just to validate ocean waves, movement, and assisting global warming calculation. So you can read more about that in the link. The second one was the simulation of uh, core convection in massive star, revealing the turbulent flows of the interior and stellar oscillations done by Professor Ewitt and collaborators. So those were, what we call heroic calculations because they basically were able to utilize the full cluster at once. So the 60,000 cores computing in parallel and communicating to each other in a very uh, harmonic and, and nice manner. So just to summarize these parts of the HPC, and I think I'm kind of running uh, short in time, but let me see if we can, if I can switch gears now to AI. Um, if you want to use these supercomputers, you need to learn parallel programming. Um, you cannot take your code as it runs in your computer, just move it to the supercomputer and expect to get the, the right scaling, the, the advantage of running on the supercomputer. It's quite the opposite. You, most of the cases, you will need to rethink a little bit, not only rewrite, but also rethink a little bit the way how you do things. Uh, depending on the hardware, uh, depending on the type of clusters, this is different. So it's not one, one size fits all, that doesn't work in supercomputers. Um, and of course, the way how you program the selection or election of your, of your language, it also matters. So let me very quickly, I think we have less than 10 minutes, less, less maybe five minutes, talk a bit what is machine learning. And the reason why I, I, I want to, to do that is because uh, we have been noticing more and more people interested in this field. So what is machine learning, first of all? Um, well, broadly speaking, machine learning is I put their model fitting, but now that we are talking, right? It's not it's not fitting anywhere, although it's going to be recorded. Let me let me use the phrase: "Is statistics on steroids?" Okay, so that is what machine learning. That's my way of seeing machine learning. In some ways, it's the ethical to data analysis, which in, may involve fitting curves to your data, determining parameters in a already established model. But it can differ from data analysis as well. If you don't know the correct model, there are algorithms that can help you that. To, with that, uh, if you are using the model to make insights of the data, but are looking for any scientific insight based upon it, that's another case. This can be particularly useful at the beginning of research when you don't have much idea and you are basically doing exploratory data analysis. So one, uh, what? Uh, okay, this is another another uh, thing that people usually differentiate in machine learning is supervised versus unsupervised learning. So supervised learning comes. Basically, you can think that your data comes with labels and you know what the right answer is. So curve fitting is one possibility because you have the values and then you can try to fit a model to that. That's one thing. Prediction type analysis like decision trees or neural network is another. Unsupervised uh, machine learning is when we are looking for patterns in the data, but we don't know uh, how they should look like. LIGO has a nice example of this. If you think about LIGO, the way for, uh, they search for gravitational waves, they have a basically unsupervised uh, recognition when all the detectors basically triggers the signal at the same time, or you have the matching filtering search where you have predefined models and they basically try to fit to those. Uh, so those are the two, two, two examples, for instance. Um, and of course, there are semi-supervised methods where basically you combine both of these. Um, let me tell you an example of, of uh, one of these uh, of, of methods, for instance, classification. Classification is in, in some way similar to regression, 
because you can basically think that you had a model to the data with no answers, and then you use the model to make predictions about the new data. Uh, what, what about if, uh, if the labels are discrete? Well, you can still do that. So these are categories now. And one case or one example of this is um, logistic regression. So logistic regression is a case where you basically do the classification, but just in categories and not in continuum values. Uh, what kind of problems are, are well suited for classification? Where bioinformatics, for instance, classifying proteins according to the functions, medical diagnosis is a big one, image processing, recognition of objects in images, handwritten text analysis, text categorization like spam filtering, sentiment analysis, uh, language recognition, flow detection. In this case, the variables or, or uh, the data can be continuous, discrete, or combination of these. What kind of a classification approaches or methods there are? One of the best known is decision tree. Basically, you can ba ba basically take decisions depending on, on um, the features of the data. Uh, logistic regression, I mentioned this, is like linear regression, but it basically has two categories, 0, 1, binary. Uh, naive Bayes, which is basically a statistical method based on, on, on Bayes. Uh, KNN, or K nearest neighbors, you basically use the K or a number of nearest neighbors to the data point to predict the category of a new point. Support vector machines is essentially a linear model of the data. And then neural networks that I will, if I had time, may talk a little bit, but it's its own thing. Um, clustering, on the other hand, is a type of unsupervised learning, basically because we are going to try to group things, uh, but without knowing which are the groups in, in, in advance. Uh, so applications of this can be finding patterns in properties of galaxies, determining proteins uh, with similar interactions, micro segmentation, question like customer who buy eggs often buy this, or Netflix offering you a particular type of movie after you watch another. Um, other machine learnings, uh, um, algorithms or topics can be, when we talk about classification algorithms, assembly methods, uh, the most well-known one is random forest. And the nice thing with this one is you can think about them as an effective field uh, theory approach, if you wish. Dimensionality reduction, examples of this is PCAs, principal component analysis. Non-parametric regressions is a kind of a enhanced regression, linear regression. And then variable selection, um, which there are a lot of them. I know I'm going fast here, um, but I want to, to reach this point and, and make some final comments. Uh, so neural networks. So basically, networks networks are are inspired by by uh, the human brain, the way in which networks connect to each other. Um, the nice thing is that these things can be trained. So you can have data. You can use the data to train the network basically fit the model and then ask questions to it. So where are then? Well, they are using almost everything. They're using image recognition, medical diagnosis, natural language processing, novelty detections, next word prediction, text sentiment analysis, system control. And I will show you some particular cases um, of, of direct astrophysical applications. Uh, one of the most well-known example is, and, and, and the motivation is, Think that, so you can see these digits here, think that I had to teach, I had to program a computer to recognize each of them. How I will go around that? Well, if I design a nine, I can tell the computer, okay, there should be a circle in the top, a line, vertical line, a one is just a vertical line. What about if it is twisted, if it is rotated? So the details are, are humongous. So instead of that, I can create a network and tell the computer, okay, this is a nine, this is a two, eight, then you figure out the rest, okay? So that's the main motivation. Uh, this is common to all neural networks, neural, neural networks approach, and is that you need to split your data in three groups, training, testing, and validation. Uh, this is quite important because you will use the training data to basically set up your network. You will use your test data to see how good the network did, and then the validation is kind of a third independent test. Uh, very quickly, how this Unix looks like, well, a neuron is nothing else than a function. It's a fancy name for a function. It has different inputs, x1, x2, x3, and then an output b. So this is in math how it look like. The important thing is each input has a weight, and then there is one bias per neuron. So you can think in vectorial forms as a vector multiplied by the input vector plus a vector of bias. Um, 
let me skip this one. And this is how the network will look like. So you have different of these neurons connected all together. Uh, there is an input layer where the data comes from. There is a hidden layer where the data is processed. And then there is an output layer where the, neuro, uh, the network basically offers the result. The important things to consider about this is that each of these has these vectors with parameters that are trainable. So we are coming back to this idea of regression models of fitting data. So what happened here is that you have a hyperspace, a humongous hyperspace of trainable parameters. And that's basically how the neural network works. You give data, you train all those parameters, you optimize those values, and at the end you have a system that you put information that the, neuron, that the network hasn't seen and is able to produce a result that is, is good enough. There are much more details about that. I'm running out of time. So let me tell you uh, the examples I have in mind. Gravitational waves, deep learning detection is one of them. This one is a very nice one because it's a couple of students that took our course and they end up doing a project with dark matter halo catalogs. So they created a convolutional neural network for simulating uh, more dark matter uh, halo catalogs. And the last one, which is a very interesting one, uh, is a paper on neural uh, ordinary differential equations. So this is an approach that can be used or is proposed to be used for solving ODEs. I uh, won't talk about that, but there are a lot of tools that you can use to implement neural networks. Uh, let me skip deep learning and just run into my conclusions. I will skip this one. If you have questions, ask me about the future trends. I will be happy to answer that in the, uh, in the question section. But I do want to mention this very quickly. So one of the things I, th I have been trying to, to Convenient this presentation is that you need to know how to com how to implement your codes in supercomputers, and these are a slide with resources. So my first uh, suggestion is to look in the supercomputers that you have close by. In the states, there are a lot of them. In Europe as well, we are in Canada. Uh, in addition to that, and this is how we met with Alejandro, is uh, try to go to summer schools. The IHPCS, International High Performance Computer Summer School, is very nice, it's free, uh, it's a very nice opportunity to meet people, very interesting and nice people. They have the Petascale Institute organized by the Blue Waters in the States, it's, it's uh, online, so anyone in any part of the world can assist. Uh, we have our educational website. Uh, if you're interested in conference, there are different conferences that you can attend. Uh, but more importantly, I realize this is a Latin American uh, webinar, so most of our audience must be in Latin America, I imagine. And I realize I don't have many resources about Latin America. Even when I came from Uruguay, I, I don't really know if there are many resources, many systems there. But, but what I can tell you is, if you have projects, if you have questions, if you have uh, you know, if you want to, to do something, uh, just contact us. We have these addresses, research at signet.utoronto.ca, or if you have questions about training, we have courses at signet.utoronto.ca, or Alejandro can share my, my email with you, so I will be more than happy to, to uh, you know, talk with any of, any of you. And I think I'm done. <laughs> Sorry, I ran a little bit uh, longer than expected, I imagine. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I know, it was too long. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. Thank you very much for this nice webinar. Uh, let me see if uh, our coordinators have some questions. Yeah, I have a couple of, but as usual, I don't have any questions. So, uh, very nice, Marcelo. I like a lot the, the talk, especially all the content that is inside is going to be very useful for the all the viewers of, the, of this webinar cycle. Okay. So, I, ha I have a couple of questions. One is, I mean, also you 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 mentioned in, at the end, but yeah, what what would be the role of the quantum computer? Because this, sure. I mean, they are still not commercial yet, but there are some. Well, okay. Semi-commercial. I don't know how to. Call no, 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 no. Actually, actually, I don't know. Are you seeing my slides again now? Yes. Okay, so for the quantum computing, there are a couple of options. Actually, uh, there are some of them are commercials. D Wave is 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 commercial. Uh, Rigetti, I think, is commercial, but IBM, I don't remember if I put the link there. If not, I can I can send the link around. IBM has a version that is available online, and you can sign up, and you have two versions. You have um, 5 qubits and I think 16 qubits, uh, and they have some nice training material. So the difference, let me talk a little bit about, there are basically two approaches right now to quantum computing. One is what we call annealing machines. 
uh, D-Way and Rigetti are annealing machines. Basically, what they do is they solve minimization problems. So think about um, uh, spins oriented in different directions and, and you set up your system like a particular configuration and then you let you let the system relax like a nice model if you wish and that is the what Rigetti and the way are solving the quantum computer in in IBM is is based on gates in 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 Q gates so it's the generalization of of the logic gates like and and not or or and none and these kind of things so you can create your own uh, quantum circuit uh, but that one is available that one is, is available for free in particular for academia so I can I, I don't think I add the link there but I can share the link with, with you guys if you are interested uh, the interesting thing about quantum computing coming from the perspective of a person that has been training computers in general is that you need to basically gave up um, the idea of discrete math. And so in, in, in computers, in classical computers, you have, okay, a bit can be a zero or a one, right? It's basically related to the fact that a circuit can have electricity flowing or not. And that is where the one and zero comes from. And that's how we discretize everything in terms of that. On quantum computers, the, the qubit can be in any superposition between zero and one. But it's not only that it can be continuing, it can be in a probability. So you need to associate a probability state to that. So that's that's basically the magic. But but coming back to your questions, there are resources that are already available uh, for, in particular, for academia research uh, to use. I don't know if I if I answered the question. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yes, in fact, but just but do you expect that, for instance? In the same trend that with the normal computer is to make clusters, the idea at the end is also to make clusters of quantum computers. It's, it's, a, it's a really good question, and, and I don't really have an answer uh, for that because, on the one hand, um, you know, we try to think about the quantum computer as an evolution of the traditional computing, but if you think in terms of the machine itself, it's a it's a complete different animal. So it's hard to see how they can connect. I know there are initiatives like uh, I think Amazon has an initiative to have, uh, and also IBM has an initiative to have uh, cloud services uh, with quantum computers, which is kind of tricky, right? It not necessarily means create clusters of, of quantum computers, but the access to the data is clusterized, if you wish. So I think we are at the very beginning of the of the era of quantum computing, but it may happen at some point. I, I, can't really answer that for sure. Okay, so just one short question because it seems there are questions from YouTube. Just one small stuff because you at the end you mentioned how it works the Niagara, the super, super the, the cluster that you have there. So, okay. is it too hard or too difficult to to apply for time in the, those clusters? Yes. Or it is kind of you have to make a Proposal, then evaluate uh, it. Is um, yes and no. <laughs> and let me tell you why. So it's very easy, but if you are in a Canadian institution or you have a Canadian collaborator, if you if you if you are in that situation, it's just an application. It takes almost one week. Uh, usually, we process that faster than that, a couple of days, top, and and that is it. Okay, it's similar to what happens sometimes here in Chile with the with the observatories that people, as right, I said, right. the Chilean institution has more priority. Exactly. It's exactly the same model. Exactly the same model. Okay, well, thank okay. you. I have more, but later I can. <laughs> sure, sure. And uh, as I oh. say, feel free to email me. Uh, probably Alejandro can share you my email with all of you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we have the question. Uh, time for two more questions. One is from Yasin Afnan. And he's asking, like, uh, like a sort of recommendation. What are the languages or so the students should learn? Okay, that's a that's a very good question. But let me rephrase the question or or, or target or answer the question in a different manner. I wouldn't categorize by by physics because it depends on what kind of problem you are trying to solve. If you are doing numerical relativity, as I as I was doing, I definitely will say Fortran C C plus plus. Um, if you are doing data analysis, like heavy, hardcore data analysis, even for high energy physics, probably Python, probably R, 
uh, there is a language that is catching up, uh, which is called Shulia. Uh, is uh, is very nice because it has the best of both both words. It's a high level language, but it can also be compiled. So. Uh, I, I'm sorry to don't give a specific answer, but uh, it depends a little bit more of what you want to do. If you want to solve ODEs or PDEs, probably your or actually PDEs uh, in a numerical manner, probably Fortran C is your best uh, best target. If you want to do some symbolic algebra, probably Python. Python is very versatile, has a ton of packages. Notice that I'm always restricting myself to open source um, uh, kind of uh, suggestions and and that is a kind of a you know um, thing that I think is good to to emphasize. Try to use as much as, as much as possible open source tools. Nowadays, we have a community where open source tools are basically at the level of any commercial software. We always have to fight with people coming from fields like engineering, where they use a lot of MATLAB or Mathematica even. But nowadays, I think tools coming from the Python, especially Sci, are are at the same level. Okay, thank you. Uh, and there's another question from Thomas Bailuns. Uh, he's asking, is there any resource collecting well turns in parallel programming, especially for shared memory systems? Uh, there are a couple of resources. There is a one called, I think we shared this one in the, in the international. Um, oh, you mean like resources for running in, in parallel? That's what I mean. I, I yeah, it looks like. Uh, again, it depends. Uh, I mean, open to the public, I'm not exactly sure. I know that you can apply for uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, which has a cloud thing, and you may get a, a free account there. Um, if you are talking about a particular experiment, of course, people from the CERN has their grid infrastructure all set up. Um, so if it is a free resource, I, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. I can talk a little bit more about the specifics to each country, in particular Canada and the United States, which are the, the ones I know the most, and maybe a little bit about Europe, uh, but not in general across the globe. Okay. Uh and I think I, I got a question from the email. If it if it is possible you to comment a little bit on the difference, like just like a scratch between CPUs and GPUs, like when should one use one of those instead of the others? What are like the main difference, like in a nutshell, sure, sure, when people sure, should sure. like for the yeah, architectures? No, for, sure. for sure, that's that is a very good question, and I already had the chance to 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 explain that during the presentation. Like they are quite different, actually. Um, like I make also the slide available because it has a lot of links and, and, and movies. But uh, basically, what changes a lot is the throughput. So remember, we define the throughput. Um, the CPU is basically just one unit processing, doing operations. It has vectorization, so it can do more than just one operation at a time. But the CPU is a beast. The CPU is a beast doing operations. Uh, is actually thought for that. If you think about the CPUs, is the is the, the the hardware controlling our monitors, right? And our monitors has I don't know how many thousand of pixels by thousand of pixels. And that computation, deciding which color each pixel has, has to do has to be done at the same time. So that's the kind of shot that the CPUs are, are good at. Now, having said that, because it feels and, and sounds like CPU is the way to go. Now, the caveats with that are CPU has very limited memory. So when you deal with CPUs, you need to think in a couple of things. Is like, OK, will my problem fit in the memory of the CPU? Because again, CPUs were thought to deal with just pixels, basically integer numbers, right? And just one at a time. It's, 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 a, it's a stream of numbers that come boom, boom, boom. It, it basically paint the, the colors in the screen, and that's it. So let me tell you just a, a quick example of what I'm trying to say. People have been, um, for several years now, probably 10 years, trying to port the numerical relativity codes to run on CPUs. And there are some papers out there where they, they they basically did a proof of principles or concepts where they say, oh, we, we were able to rewrite Einstein equations and run it on the CPU. 
turns out that no one is using that approach because it doesn't perform well for that kind of problem. So when people usually ask me, okay, is it better to use CPUs or CPUs? I will say, okay, which is your problem? If it is uh, matrix operations, yeah, probably CPUs are the, are the right approach. An example of this is neural networks, machine learning on, on that regards. Most of the frameworks are listed in the slides most of them has a backend running on the CPUs because CPUs are very good doing that kind of computation. Um, same thing with accelerators, it's more or less the same idea. The main difference are how the memory is handled. The programming is very nasty. So programming cores, programming CPUs can be complicated. It has a, a medium uh, learning curve, I would say. Programming CPUs is a complete different beast. It's, it has a steep learning curve. So you need to actually, to take full advantage of the CPU, you need to be very uh, very knowledgeable about CUDA, about uh, OpenCL if you go in that direction, but at least CUDA. OpenACC is tackling, starting to tackle that. The latest version of OpenMP4 uh, has an offload to accelerators, which can take advantage of the CPU. But the caveat there is it's never going to be as efficient as, as just programming pure CUDA on the CPU. OK, thank you very much, Marcelo. Uh, so pleasure. the slides will be available in our web page in a couple of days. And we will post all the information of Marcelo if you need something. So thank you. And stay tuned for our next uh, webinar, which is going to happen in two weeks. Bye-bye. Thank you, Marcelo, for this nice webinar. Thank you very much for having me.